Computational fluid dynamics. So if dynamic simulation looks at a process from a typical process uh, steady state simulation and makes it dynamic, computational fluid dynamics is a much finer scale than dynamic simulation. CFD, instead of looking at a system, looks at a pipe or an exchanger or the internals of whatever you're looking at. It is a detailed fluid flow modeling inside a limited domain. So again, these need usually really pretty small. Uh, a whole vessel, you're not even looking at a whole vessel. Usually you're looking at the top tray or a, a segment of pipe, but a very limited domain and it uses, obviously computational, it uses computers to solve uh, flows. It, laminar turbulent, compressible, incompressible, Single phase, it, 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 the models are now good enough that they can model any of these, whatever you're trying to look at. And again, is an iterative process where it not only converges pressures, temperatures, and flows, but actually converges the stresses within it with, within the interaction of the fluid to actually get flow profiles inside of whatever, uh, whatever domain you're looking at. And in this scenario, not only is it an iterative process, but it is a much slower iterative process. If you have uh, 1 e to the minus 3 as a time step, that's actually a pretty big time step for CFD. You're often looking at 1 e to the minus 6 seconds. So you need to do a million computations to get one second of real time in a study, which means this takes a very long time to do, which means it's very expensive, which means Maybe CFD isn't what your client is really looking for, even though it looks pretty neat. So why then would you do a CFD study? Well, it basically allows you to look inside with x-ray glasses what's going on in a particular situation with a particular set of conditions. That allows you to prevent problems from happening. It allows you to explain maybe why something is occurring. We looked at a, an exchanger, a, a condenser actually once. Uh, we took a 2D slice of it and the, the tubes on the bottom were failing. We found out that instead of the steam, we thought maybe the steam was impinging somehow. Well, the steam was blasting out of the sparger, coming down around the sides, and basically this jet of steam was waving back and forth across the bottom tubes exactly where they were failing. That's what's going on. Okay, we put some baffles in, prevent that from happening, slow down the steam. Those are some of the ways CFD can be very valuable you can understand what's going on, and that's usually the, the point. What is going on here? What happened here? But also for, from a design perspective, what will happen? What would happen here at a very detailed level? The other reason is, is to impress people. Really, that often is unfortunately the case with CFD, is to make something that probably wasn't really needed, but you wanted to impress somebody so you can give this cool looking video of what's going on so that they can then turn and say, hey, look, we did our due diligence, look at all the work that we did to prove this. Often that's the case. Still, there are, I, I have, we've seen here, there are good reasons to do CFD. Often spending 30, 60, $100,000 to do a very small study, uh, this, this software is uh, even more expensive than uh, other softwares out there, and you need 64 processors coupled together to get a reasonable simulation. It's expensive. So again, it comes down to why are we engineers? We're engineers to, do a pro to design something, to make something better, but that always has to be tied into the, the client's perspective that yes, they want a good solution, a, a knowledgeable solution, but they also want to make the most for their money. And if, if something isn't going to do that, I don't recommend doing it. So again, how, how to perform CFD, again, You'll see this a lot, start with the study basis. Get that collaborative document, get buy-in from everybody involved. What are you trying to accomplish? Ask, begin with the right, begin with the end in mind. What are you really trying to accomplish with this? Not a flow profile is if that's what you end up with. Well, why did you end up with that? And the example we'll go through is um, one, of the, one of the places we wanted a flow profile and why it was the right thing to focus on. Once you've set your study basis and said this is the domain we're gonna build, define the geometry. And 
part of that is where, where are your inlet and outlet locations going to be? Because flow takes a while to develop, and a flow, flow profile takes a while to develop, and often you don't know, you have to find some point where you can stably and reasonably assume some sort of plug flow. So that, or at least some way, or annular flow, or some sort of flow profile that you can take from literature and say, I expect this ring of liquid to be here with vapor on the inside, or whatever it is. And then you build that in a three-dimensional three model. You build, if the 3D CAD is, experience is very helpful here because that's effectively what you're doing, is you're designing something in a 3D CAD program. There's all sorts of tools to take something from SolidWorks or Autodesk or whatever to import it into a CAD program, uh, from a CAD program into whatever CFD solver you're using. Once you have that, you need to discretize the volumes. You need to apply a 3D mesh to the model because the way CFD works is it solves for each one of these little cubes or uh, tetrahedron or whatever they are, each one of those volumes has flow moving through it that's passing flow to the cube to the cell next to it and it has to converge all of that. So you have to take, a, if you're taking a pipe, that whole pipe then has to be broken down into little cubes that it solves the pressures, temperatures, flows, and stresses in each one of those little cubes, converges, moves forward in time, converges again. Smaller cells allow for greater detail. Smaller cells mean a much bigger model. It's very easy to get many millions of cells in a model, each one of which then has to converge every time step. It, it is a balance between, I need detail here, but I don't need detail elsewhere. Once the mesh has been set, then you define your boundary conditions. I have flow coming in at this point, and I have a pressure outlet that the flow exits at this point. And then you set your turbulence equations. Turbulence equations are really the, the heart of CFD because if you're trying to develop flow profile, you need to know how fluid interacts with itself. And if you can solve it all the way down to the full equations, there are models out there that will use the exact equations, but those are computationally expensive. Reynolds stress models, some of the others out there will solve all sorts of transport equations simultaneously, but there are some pretty good amalgamated algorithms that say, okay, well, they normally act in this K epsilon, K omega. None of you remember any of that, that's fine. Those are, there, there are some good ways to reduce the amount of computation needed to get something done and still provide a valuable, meaningful result. Again, you run it and you say, that's not what I meant. And you change either your uh, your model, you change your assumptions, you go through that iterative process within your study basis to say, okay, this is what we thought we were modeling, this is what we're really modeling, is everybody on board with that? And then you wait days and days and days and days and days uh, babysitting this computer, going back, did you crash, are you still working, did you crash, are you still working? As it goes through and converges, moves forward in time, converges, moves forward in time, converges, Etc. Obviously, the more processors you have working on it, it's able to split up the computations across several processors and bring it all back together to a common solution. The more processors you have, the faster the simulation goes. Our, ours, our computers we use, not only have solid state drives, uh, but they're, they're set up to write to two solid state drives together. You want a computer in our series of computers where the slowest thing on it is the motherboard. Nothing else, I don't know how many of you know anything about computers, but computation, you don't want anything limiting it except what you can't do any faster. When you're done with this, you do some post-processing. Basically, as it moves through time, you take pictures of something. You export a, a photo or a JPEG or whatever, and then when you have all these JPEGs from each time step, that's all a movie is, is pictures stitched together. You can create a video which shows what's going on there in, over the course of that run. And again, when all that's done, you put it, package it all together, you take your study basis, put it all together, and you have a final report. Available software out there, ANSYS is pretty much the gorilla. They have both Fluent and CFX. Fluent is what we use because it does multi-phase better. CFX is good for a lot of things. ANSYS developed CFX and Fluent developed Fluent until ANSYS bought out Fluent a number of years ago. They offer both now, but 
if you're trying to do something two phase and you need a really detailed answer, Fluent is still the best tool to use. I'm probably going to slaughter this to Salt System as makers of SolidWorks and Abacus. They have their own tools that are allow you to take something from SolidWorks and just run it in their C and more and more uh, Autodesk also. You take your geometry and you use their solver, and often that's good enough. Because if, if what you're trying to do is come up with an exact answer, that may not be what the client's looking for. Clients don't always need the kitchen sink. They just need to know, go in the kitchen and see what's there. And often that's a better, better answer for a client than saying, we need to do all of this stuff that maybe you don't really do. Because yes, maybe you made an extra dollar today, but they won't come back to you tomorrow. So here's, here's an example of what, something we did. It's a stripper overhead. There is a thermal well here that they wanted to increase the flow through this from the nominal plant capacity was 45,000 barrels a day. They wanted to go to 60,000 barrels a day through that. When you have flow moving past a rigid object, it tends to wobble. And as it's wobbling from flow-induced stresses, it can get into a cyclical pattern and break off. And you, if you're gonna increase flow, you really wanna make sure that, that doesn't happen. They wanted to know if they increase flow, what was the likelihood of that happening? So we couldn't just start here because we didn't have any idea what the flow profile was going in up through here. Was, it, was, it, was the flow weighted to one side more? What, what actually happens? Because the flow comes in, it slams in this corner, creates a high pressure zone here, which is actually what makes the fluid turn. It's, it's a high pressure region of uh, overhead uh, vapor that actually pushes fluid, not the wall itself. Interesting fluid dynamics things that go on here. So since we don't know what's going on there, we had to go all the way down to the top tray. We said, okay, we're gonna assume relatively, with relative confidence that there is a, a, a uniform flow coming up from each side of the, um, that, that tray and then we put all these uh, false downcomer and internal in the way so that as it came up from here, went past that and then went into the pipe, we had a relatively good idea of what is going on there in terms of that flow so that we can have a good measuring point here. You then need to have enough space beyond it to be able to uh, get a good, make sure that the flow uh, dissipates correctly going out of it. So 20 pipe diameters is usually a roughly good estimate there. But you can see very quickly that we want to look at this. But it came a very big model to be able to look at that with any degree of certainty. What we get from this is a bunch of vectors. It's hard to see. These are all actually very little arrows. You can't tell from here that they, that's what they are. But uh, the color of the arrow is the velocity. So a dark blue is stagnant. There's a little stagnant point there. And then these little eddies coming off the back side of it. and the, the the vapor accelerates as it goes around it and then stagnates here with a relatively, relatively plug flow immediately around it. And when you set them in motion, you, you get a little video that tells you what's going on. And it, you can see that as the flow moves past it, this, this wobbles. And that's because it creates a lower pressure zone here that makes the flow want to go there, which creates a lower pressure zone here, which makes the flow want to go there to understand what's going on in this scenario. We were able to calculate for them the velocity here, which they could use some correlations to say, at 60,000 pounds and 6,000 barrels a day, this thing will probably work okay. They now want to know, well, what's it going to do at 75,000 barrels a day? Well, since we've already solved this, they don't really need to do this again because we have a relatively good understanding. What does the flow profile look like there? All right, that's another 25% on top of it. The velocity is probably 24 to 26% higher than it is now at that, uh, at that new rate. They keep coming to us because we don't say, okay, that's another $30,000 to do that. We say, this is the answer you're looking for, and we get increasingly challenging problems that, that's that shiny object, that increasingly, that's, that's what makes engineering worth it for me, is solving interesting problems. This is a, uh, the lift coefficient. This is, this is the wobble I was talking about as the flow increases and decreases on either side of it, and we have that, that waving action, it creates lift on that thermal well. And that lift is, 
at least for this half second, or this is actually just to two tenths of a second in this particular, it's not, it's not stable, it's not allowed to get into a harmonic range. We, we are not particularly concerned that this is gonna go into a harmonic range where it's gonna be wobbling at a constant rate and break off at 60,000 barrels a day. At 75, they may have some issues, but at least at this point, uh, we're not, we weren't concerned enough that they couldn't, because sure, the answer is actually put a new thermal well in there, but you gotta shut down to do that. And shutting down is very, very expensive. You lose all sorts of revenue. No client wants to do that. 